Hey everyone, welcome back to the course. So this week we're starting a new topic in the course and we're gonna start developing a complex uh, model for space planning using the concept of subdivision. So we're gonna talk about subdivision more uh, in, in the next several weeks as we build up our definition. Uh, but the first topic we're gonna get into this week is recursion and how we can start to develop recursive based algorithms which are the backbone of the foundation of our subdivision-based uh, method. So this really carries on from our topics from the last couple of weeks when we started looking at the, the basic uh, foundations and elements of, of Python. So last week we looked at functions as a basic element of Python, and we looked at how we can create uh, custom functions in Python, basically by defining the function uh, here in this first line, and then within the body of the function, we do something, perform some kind of action based on um, a number of lines of code, and then finally return a result of running that function based on certain inputs uh, back into our main script. Now, when we talk about recursive functions, a recursive function is basically a function that can call itself within the body of the function. So you see here, taking our basic uh, function definition, we can make that function recursive by basically putting a call to the same function within the body uh, of that function. And what this looks like, it almost becomes like a kind of nested logic within the function, right? So we call the function the first time, and then when the function runs, at some point in that function, it runs itself again. So it's a kind of like nested spiraling logic because when we call that function again, it runs again, and it calls itself again and so on and so forth. So writing a recursive function technically is fairly easy, but if you don't handle it the right way, by default, you're gonna get into this endless logic and it's gonna crash your program because if you don't have a way for this recursive calling of functions uh, to stop at some point, then the whole process goes on forever and it's basically gonna cause your, your script to crash. So that's why you see these two lines of code. Basically, um, there's some logic or some condition which we test for, uh, which actually stops the recursive process and creates a different return. So we already looked at last week, you know, creating multiple returns within a single function allows us to uh, stop the function at various points based on certain conditions. And in this case, within the recursive process, we have a way for the input to basically uh, decrease by one each time. And when that input becomes zero, then we actually return the input. Otherwise, we return the input plus the value returned from that function. So this is a really simple, um, really basic kind of recursive function, um, which adds progressively numbers based on a starting number. So if you follow the logic here, if we run recursive add with an input of three, Right, we enter the first function call here. We have three, we check if the input is zero. It's not, so then we go on to this line, which will take three as the input and run that function again and decrease that number by one. So we're basically running the same function again, but now the input is two, right? So we can step through these function calls here um, and see how that nested logic basically plays itself out. So after the first time we run the function, we basically get the result three plus the value of that function run again with three minus one, which is two. And then we run the function again, the same exact way. And so the output of that function will be two plus the value of the function with two minus one, which is one. So that's the third time the function is called. Finally, we run the function with one minus one, which uh, has an input of zero. We check if the input is zero. Now we reach our stopping criteria. So we return zero directly without calling the function again. And that value now works its way back up the stack of function calls, right? So when we call the function with zero, we get a zero. And then we add that to one, add that result to two, and then add that result to three to get our final um, result here of six. So that's a basic definition of a, of a recursive function. Now, why would we want to write functions like this? You know, recursion is this concept which can be pretty hard to understand because you're dealing with these nested logics. So it's not 
as easy as you know traditional procedural code where you're running line by line you know maybe you check a conditional maybe you do a loop maybe you embed some kind of code into a function but still like things tend to run one you know one by one so it can be easy to understand or predict like what that code will do but with recursive functions because we have this embedded uh, logic it could be a bit hard to unpack them especially if we start to get into more complex recursive behavior where you know based on certain conditions the function might call itself once or maybe the function calls itself twice or it doesn't call itself you have to kind of trace through this like tree of uh, behaviors and it could be quite complex to kind of think through when you're coding these things uh, what they're going to do and also make sure you're putting in the right stopping logics to make sure you don't get into an endless loop uh, and crash your program so recursion can be hard to work with uh, but it does have a lot of value for example recursion is the principle behind a lot of the most popular and efficient algorithms that are out there for example uh, with sorting, one of the most efficient sorting algorithms is called quicksort, and quicksort is based on a recursive function. And it's actually based on a principle that's based on recursion of algorithm development called divide and conquer. So as the name suggests, divide and conquer is an idea where instead of solving a complex problem like sorting a set of numbers directly, which might take a lot of time, you basically start to split the problem into smaller chunks with the idea that once you split a problem into pieces, you can apply that same logic to each piece and then do that progressively in this recursive way uh, to kind of like figure something out about each of those component pieces and then work the logic back up the stack uh, to solve your problem. So in the case of quicksort, we can take a look at how this recursive logic plays out. So with sorting, we start with a set of numbers kind of randomly shuffled, and we wanna get an um, uh, ordering of these numbers from smallest to largest, right? So we could go through each number, figure out where it goes. This is gonna take a lot of time, right? So instead, the way quicksort works is it picks a number at random. In this case, we're gonna always pick the median, like the middle number in the set of randomly uh, ordered numbers. So here we pick five and whatever number we pick, we're gonna go through each of the other numbers and we're only gonna decide if each number is smaller or equal to that number we picked. So we just have to do one check. We don't have to check every number against every other number. We just have to check, is it smaller than five? If it is, we'll put it on the left side of five. And if it's bigger, we'll put it on the right side of five. And that's one step of the process. And now we have these two pieces the numbers to the left. Again, we're not ordering these yet. We're just putting them into that, into that bucket on the left side. And then we have the other set of numbers on the right. And now we're gonna call that same function again on both buckets, right? So with this bucket, we're gonna take the middle number, we're gonna set it aside. And then we're gonna sort the other numbers as being less than that number, in this case, less than three and bigger than three. We're gonna do the same thing with this set using seven, smaller than seven, and larger than seven. And we're gonna do that again, as long as the buckets are bigger than two values, we can always run this process, right? So we run it again here, sort the numbers, and as soon as we get to a point where the buckets are one or two elements only, the result is they're all gonna be sorted because we've kind of recursively done the sorting in these kind of, uh, by constantly splitting the data set into two parts, once we reach the end of that process, they're already sorted and all we have to do is combine all the values together. And to us, this may seem like a more convoluted process, right, than just taking the numbers and arranging them. But it's actually true that with this divide and conquer approach, because we're constantly splitting the big problem into smaller and smaller problems, that this is actually more computationally efficient than doing it the, the way that may be intuitive for us. And you find this a lot in computation that what makes sense for a computer to do or what is more efficient for a computer to do actually may be not the same thing as what makes the most sense for us to do. That the way that's efficient for a computer it seems to us actually more complicated, but it runs much faster. And you'll find a lot of these kind of recursive algorithms happening in uh, algorithm development in a way to split up parts into smaller pieces so that 
you can solve the problem in a faster way. So the recursive approach is really popular in algorithm development. Uh, it's also very prevalent in nature. So if you look at the forms of nature, you'll actually find recursion everywhere because everything in nature, all form in nature, develops in this kind of step-by-step -step process, right? Nothing in nature sort of manifests or appears all at once. Everything in nature is based on something happening over time, and there's always some kind of basic process behind it. But as the process plays out, you start to develop all these complex patterns and all these complex forms that we see in nature. So we have processes like growth, decay, fracturing. These are all kind of simple operations, right? One thing splits into two, or one thing divides into two. But as this process enacts over and over again, it's always working on kind of like uh, smaller versions of itself, right? So when that tree starts growing, it's a sapling. At some point, the sapling splits into multiple branches, and then everything kind of uh, grows together and the branches split into more branches. And so you get this complex form through a simple process repeated over and over. And the form, you know, may be complex, but it has this property of being self-similar, right? Where a tree may be very complex structure, but each branch is sort of a smaller version of the branch that it came from before. So this idea of complexity uh, and self-similarity is very prevalent in nature. And it's the way that nature is actually able to create a lot of complexity without a lot of like top-down um, knowledge or top-down logic, right? All the logic in nature is really bottom-up. It's based on simple processes done over and over again. So you see the same kind of um, recursive complex geometry in the growth of plants you know, in the way that landscapes form or fracture. And, you know, you get the self-similarity between the structure at, at the branches of the, of the tree, as well as inside the veining of the leaves of the tree. So this idea of the recursive nature of geometry, uh, of geometry in the natural world was really picked up uh, by a mathematician and researcher uh, working in the 1950s called, called Benoit Mandelbrot. So he actually wrote a book called The Fractal Geometry of Nature. And he was a mathematician, but you know, when he was starting to work, he realized that when he observed forms in nature, none of them really followed the Euclidean logic uh, or the regular logic of Euclidean geometry, right? So when you see a mountain, it doesn't look like a cone. You know, when you see a tree, it doesn't look like a sphere. So he was really questioning the limitations of basic Euclidean geometry and saying that, you know, why is it that the geometry we can represent in math is so different than what exists in nature? You know, and he, he actually uh, wrote an entire theory of fractal geometry. We tried to first understand how geometry forms in nature and then describe it in mathematical terms. And even though he wasn't like that much involved with uh, computers directly, his work became very influential for early computing and early computer graphics actually. Um, you know, as he was describing the equations for understanding this kind of natural complex forms uh, through mathematics, he was working with teams of computer scientists to encode those logics and algorithms into some of the earliest computers uh, to actually create some of the earliest applications of generative natural geometry. So he was actually working with computer scientists to program logics that can create very natural looking forms for the first time. It's the first time that we can actually use this kind of procedural generation to create computer simulations of natural topographies and other natural forms. And this work was used in some of the first like video games and computer graphics and movies uh, to create these simulated environments. So recursion and this idea of uh, complex self-similar forms has been very useful in a number of fields. Uh, how is it useful to us? Well, we can actually use this idea of recursion to create similar complexity in our generative models in a way that we can actually abstract the control of the geometry itself and use a small set of simple parameters driven by our genetic algorithm to control a much more complex recursive based pro process of actually generating the final form. So if we want to create complex form, but don't want to expose all the different parameters that can drive that form, 
we can actually embed a logic of form generation into a set of rules. And then as we run those rules recursively on the geometry, we can control which rules get executed based on the parameters that are used by our optimization uh, algorithm. So let's look at a really simple example of the kind of recursive uh, system we can create. And then for the rest of the class, we're going to do a demo where we actually code this kind of simple recursive system in Python and Grasshopper. And um, the idea of, of writing Python is actually very useful because this kind of recursive logic where a function calls itself is actually only possible when you're writing code. You can see that in the Python code example, writing a recursive function is very easy, right? It's hard to control it maybe or understand it, but writing it is pretty trivial. Like you just write the function call inside the function itself. But to do this in Grasshopper, you know, you have to actually connect the component to itself, which is not allowed just in the definition of, of Grasshopper. So you can already see like a really clear example of why we went through all the Python tutorials that this kind of um, recursive, recursive logic is actually not possible to do uh, without writing some Python code. Okay, so let's look at an example of the kind of uh, system we can create uh, using this idea of recursion in Python. So let's, as an example, uh, imagine we're going to create a kind of branching system which is driven by a small set of rules. So we'll start with a point, and based on that point, this tree can grow based on following one of three rules. So the first rule, rule zero, is nothing happens. Rule one is that point gets used to create a single line going vertically. And then rule two, that point is used to create two new lines or branches, which each result in another point. And we can imagine running these rules over and over again by applying these uh, rules recursively where the end point of each rule becomes the start point of every rule after. So let's kind of walk through this process. And here we're gonna have the starting point. We always need some point for the logic to start. And then we have two columns here. One is the parameter. So this is going to be storing the list of parameters which control which rule we call in order. And over here on the right, we have a list which is storing the points which we use as the starting points every time we run a rule. And this will show us how we can actually create a lot of variation of the final outcome just based on encoding a set of rules and then letting our parameters actually just dictate not what the form should look like, but the rule that should be run at each step. And these parameters ultimately is what is gonna be uh, input by our genetic algorithm. And then the output is the thing that we can measure to basically tell the algorithm what forms we want. And once we run the optimization, the algorithm is basically gonna be able to figure out which order of which parameters it should use in order to get the outputs that we're after. So we, if we start with a starting point here, we're gonna call that P1. And we're gonna start by putting that P1 as the only point in this list of points. So when we start the growth process, we might, let's just pick a rule at random. We might pick rule number one. And to run rule number one, we're gonna take the first point of the list out of the list. And after we run the rule, we've added another point, P2 here and we're gonna add P2 to the list. So every time we run a rule based on a parameter, we take the first point out of the list, and then whatever points that rule produces, we're gonna add them to the end of the list. And now we run that process recursively by taking that list and applying that uh, function again, now with a new parameter. So now we start with point two, we pop that out of the list, and our parameter is two, so we assign rule two. And when we run rule two on point two, we create two new points, P3 and P4. And we put those, we append them to our list of points. And now we can run this logic recursively any number of times, actually, 
as long as we have parameters or points in our lists, right? So the next parameter may be zero. So we call rule zero. We pop the first point in our list off the list, point three. Now this rule doesn't produce any points. So we're just left with point four in our list. And we can run our logic again. And now the parameter might be one again. So we pop 0.4 out of the list. We create another 0.5 and we put in the list. And we can run this any number of times based on a set of parameters, as long as we have parameters to choose from. And we have uh, points in the list that we can use. Right? And now you can think of this as a kind of encoding where we have four parameters which have three choices, zero, one, or two, encoding this fairly complex form, right? So the final form or the outcome of this model is actually a combination of a set of predetermined rules. Here we have three rules that encode the types of geometry that we can produce. And then the simple set of parameters which encode actually how that logic plays out over time. And now by changing these parameters, for example, we can change it to one, one, two, we can create different structures, right? So one, one, two produces two linear growths and then one branching growth, right? And once we've done that branch, we still have 0.3 in the list. So now we have to run zero to basically end the growth here. Now we move on to 0.4, zero again, causes no branching. So we move on to 0.5 and now we're point when we have 0.5, we run the first rule to create the line here. So for us, it might be difficult to find, to kind of understand the correspondence between like a set of numbers and the final form. But remember that the, the genetic algorithm doesn't really care that the correspondence makes sense, right? It already doesn't really know anything about the model. Its only goal is to control the set of parameters and learn just by doing, just by like constantly trying different things how to maximize whatever value we find in the outcome. So we might wanna make the tree as big as possible and we run the optimization and it's gonna figure out which of those rules in what order is gonna cause the tree to be as big as possible. So it's a very uh, simple example of a recursive uh, system that we can program as a gen generative model. Um, and for, for the rest of today's demo, we're actually going to encode almost exactly that logic into our generative model to create a branching, um, uh, a branching uh, system, which we can optimize to do different things. For example, get as big as possible or avoid collisions with another object. And then starting next week, we're actually gonna implement uh, a very similar recursive process, which is driven by a set of parameters, but now the function or the rules that get enacted, instead of creating geometry through branching, they're actually gonna subdivide a shape uh, several number of times. So we're gonna switch from a kind of branching logic to a subdivision logic to actually start developing our space planning uh, system. But the key here is that underneath that logic, it's the same exact approach, that there's a recursive process based on parameters driving both the way in which the branching uh, happens sequentially, starting from a single point, to the way that the subdivision of spaces happens progressively starting with a single boundary space and getting divided several number of times to create a smaller set of spaces. Okay, so today we're gonna to do the branching example and then over the course of the next three weeks, we're gonna actually build out this fully fledged uh, subdivision space planning example, which is gonna take a space boundary, divide it into a set of smaller spaces, track the adjacencies between the spaces and then map a certain set of programs that we want to fit in the space and then optimize towards making sure that the spaces are the right size and that the spaces that we want connected to each other are connected in the floor plan.